Dorian, I think you should come look at this. He stepped to the window and looked out over Kaleras. Marching into the city were 20,000 soldiers, 2,000 horse, and 200 meisters. Dorian's little brother, Peric, had returned from the frieze. Serfs were piling out of the way of a group of horsemen who had advanced before the army. Dorian didn't have to see the banners to know it had to be Peric himself. Dorian and Janine ran down the stairs two at a time, winding down and down to the base of the Tiger Tower. The grim cats favored him with their fanged smiles, mocking him. There was still time. If they could get to the front gate, they could cross Lux Bridge a few minutes before Peric arrived. As always, the slaves' tunnels were dark. In the distance, figures clashed with sword and spell, but Dorian was able to take them around the worst of the fray. He could see his half-brothers from a great distance. The path they were forced to take took them down a rough-hewn stone tunnel past the Calyrium where the goddess resided. The very stone down here stank of beer. Dorian rounded a corner a mere hundred paces from the castle's front gate and found himself staring at the back of an eighthling. Usually, he would have seen the young man, but the proximity of the Calyrium confused him. He froze. Janine yanked him back into the rough tunnel. Gal is not here, folk! Mubulu really took her to Scenaria. Damn it! He really does think he's the High King. So much for seizing Kali. What do we do now? Kali was still in Scenaria? No wonder it didn't feel quite as oppressive down here as Dorian remembered. We got to join the raid. If we help him stop Peric at the bridge, he might let us leave. Peric or Tavi would kill us no matter what. Dorian and Janine scooted back into the tunnel as quickly and as quietly as they could, but it was almost 50 paces before it intersected with another hallway. No way they could run that far without the Aethlings hearing or seeing them. As soon as they found a large cavity in the rough wall, Dorian pushed Janine into it and then pressed himself as close as he could, but his thin sleeve caught on the stone and tore. One of the Aethlings stepped into the tunnel and raised his staff. A flame blazed up on it, illuminating the hall and his face. He was perhaps fourteen, as was the youth beside him. Both were short and slender and homely, bearing little of their father's robust good looks and only a small portion of his power. I can take them. Even with his southern magic, Dorian was stronger than they were, but he didn't want it to come to that. Come on. Turn. Turn. If they turned, Dorian could take a shortcut and beat them to Lux Bridge. Everything was so close he could taste it. Had not the god favored him already by holding off the snows? Lord, please. I swear I heard something. We don't have time for this, Vic. But Vic strode forward, his staff held high. He came within ten paces and paused. Dorian readied himself. Vic stepped closer. Five paces away now. Dorian was frozen, one eye exposed. Surely Vic would see them. He had to. And if Dorian didn't raise some defense, Vic would murder them where they stood. But if he did raise a defense, Vic would sense it. Either way was a decision. It wasn't the voice of the god. It was the voice of fear. I can take them. Dorian stepped out of the crevice and lashed out at Vic with fire missiles. He recognized his mistake the moment the missiles diverted and flew down the tunnel toward Vic's brother. The boys were twins. Fraternal twins, or Dorian would have recognized it at once. Twins could make a weave to protect each other at the expense of protecting themselves. That defense, if given fully, was far stronger than a Meister could give himself. The counter-strike came from Vic, much stronger than he should have been capable of. Ah, it was a hammer fist, a spinning blue cone that in his youthful enthusiasm, Vic had actually embellished to look like a flaming fist. Rather than dodge it, Dorian had to stop it completely to make sure it didn't kill Janine behind him. Destroy! Another fist came a second later from Vic's twin. Dorian blocked it too. Suddenly aware of how much magic he'd used today, he was getting exhausted. With fingers of magic, he reached beneath Vic's shield and twisted it onto himself. It surprised the boy so much that he abandoned his next attack. Down the hall, his twin did not. His next hammer fist was whipped in a tight circle by the shield that was now protecting Dorian and arced into Vic instead. Dorian flung a single fire missile down the hall. With Vic dead, the twin was now unshielded, and a fire missile pierced his chest. No! 
Picking up Vic's staff, Dorian pulled Janine down the hall. They could still make it to the bridge. It was close now. The last hallway was clear, and though the mighty gate was closed, the sally port opened from the inside. Almost there. The mighty double gates were flung open. The rancid stench of beer washed over Dorian and Janine. Four young men stood before them, their skin awash with a knotted, dark, tattoo-like beard. They were ready. They'd sensed Dorian coming. Dorian threw up a hurried shield, as thick as he could manage with the rest of his talent, and turned to flee. In rapid succession, the shield absorbed a hammer fist, eight fire missiles, the staccato jabs of a needler, and the diffuse flame called a dragon tongue meant to finish an opponent after his shield went down. But Dorian's shields weren't down. He could survive another wave so long as none of them dared a pit worm. Blam! There was a young man behind Dorian. It was Tobby, with three of his own eighthlings blocking the hall's other exit. The first group stopped attacking Dorian instantly. Dorian looked from one camp to the other, and they looked at him. He and Janine were trapped between them. Hold! I am Dorian Ursul, the son that was. I know they expunged my name from the records, but I'm sure you've heard the rumors. I'm real, and you can't afford to attack me. You're not even a meister. Why? Even if I were only a magus, I wouldn't go down easily. If either of you attack me, you'll leave yourselves open to be attacked by the other. But I am an Ursul of the Twelfth Shura. Just a touch. He could manage that much and still not surrender to the Veer. Dorian reached down... The deer rushed from the depths like a leviathan and rode the surface of his skin in great knots that obscured almost all of his skin. <laughs> Quickly, he pushed it back. The Aethlings, all of them 16 or 17 years old at most, looked at him with awe. Several of the boys standing with Tavi looked on the verge of bolting. An illusion! An illusion that smells? Yes, Dreyf is the first of this seed class. Tavi's the pretender. What do you want? Just to leave. I'll go, and then you can slaughter each other to your heart's content. As Dorian addressed Dreyf, Dorian let his eyes go to the staff amplifier he carried. He hadn't used the Aethling's hand speech in years, but with his body blocking Tavi's view, he moved his hands to signal over the amplifier for you. Drafe's eyes glittered. The amplifier would be enough to turn the battle. Fair enough! Get out! Drafe's fingers signaled when. Dorian was trying to remember the finger speech vocabulary he hadn't used for so many years to answer Drafe's question. There it was. He remembered. When we get to the bridge, Drafe looked satisfied, though tension still stood stark on every feature, and Dorian and Janine started walking. The eight Aethlings all had their eyes jumping from Dorian to their opponents on the opposite side of the hall. For them, any move Dorian made might be the distraction they or their enemy might take advantage of. And whether he made it out of the hall alive or not, they would fight. Soon. Remember to walk like a... It was too late. Janine had been drilled on proper comportment for far too long. Ah, she stays! Tavi reached out with Veer to grab Janine. The move set one of Drafe's boys off. He threw up a crackling shield reflexively. That unleashed a magical firestorm. Dorian threw a shield around himself and Janine. A fire missile made it through before the shield formed and scored his ribs. He hunched and almost lost the shield. Janine grabbed him and held him upright. Most of the attacks weren't directed at Dorian and Janine, but they were in the line of fire. Dorian's shield thinned, layer after layer snapping, melting, withering. The Aethlings were all fresh. This battle would last long after Dorian's shields finally gave way. He was going to die. And worse, he was going to let Janine die. He had failed her. No, not while I have breath. God forgive me for what I'm about to do. It was no true prayer to beg forgiveness while choosing to sin, but he meant it fervently all the same. Dorian reached to the beer. It came joyfully. Dorian stood and flung his arms out. 
As they passed in front of him, he saw that his skin had totally disappeared beneath the all-absorbing, wriggling blackness. Nor did the veer stop at the bounds of his body. They lashed out from his arms, out farther and farther, like great wings, and came down on either side, barely registering the Aethling's last desperate attacks. He felt the boys crunch beneath those mighty wings, like beetles popping under his boot. Their shields broke like shells, and the softness within was ground to gory smears on the rock. The beer sang power and hatred and strength. It is vile! Dorian quieted the veer from his skin with effort. Are you all right? Janine's big, beautiful eyes were wider than he'd ever seen them. She tried to speak, couldn't, and nodded instead. I'm sorry. It was that, or die, who were almost there. As they stepped through the now smoking gate, Dorian saw that he was wrong. Halfway across the glowing spans of Luxbridge, was a man in a majestic white ermine cloak like Gareth Ursol had worn. He wore the gold chains of a god king around his neck and veer swam on his skin. Dorian's brother, Peric Ursul, had come to claim his throne, and blocking the bridge with him stood six full Wurdmeisters. On the third night after they made it through Forglund's Pass and set up camp, Devi finally spoke to V. Let us train together, wet boy. You, uh, you, Gibbet's apprentice? Yes. Devi drew a pair of sighs. The night angel did kill him. I know. I couldn't be happier. The smile faded into puzzlement. You seek no vengeance? I've fucked men for smaller favors. I wanted to kill Hugh since I was 13. Too much talk. Devi bent over B's bedroll where she had put her sword. He poked the point of one sigh at the juncture of blade and hilt and flicked her sword to her. She caught it and tested the edge. It was blunted with a thin shield of magic, but a strong blow would still cut. Devi checked all six points of his size. V had never fought against size. The sigh looked like a short sword with a narrow blade, except that the hilt swept in a broad U for catching blades. Each tine was sharpened. Holding the sighs in one hand, Devi removed his horsehide cloak and draped it over a rock. V followed suit reluctantly. Then Devi turned, bowed, spun the sighs in his hands, and took an impossibly low, ready stance. V's doubts about such a low stance were broken at the first clash. He leapt forward, catching her sword with one sigh, and then the other and twisting as he sprang like a snake. V's sword spun from her grasp, and she found a sigh touching her throat, while the other jabbed the small of her back. Devi's face was impassive. He stepped back wordlessly and flicked her blade back to her. She lasted 15 seconds the second time and didn't lose her blade, though Devi twisted it far out of the way and touched her ribs with the other side. After a few minutes, she was beginning to understand. Then, Devi changed stances. He sidestepped her first cut, not even using the size, and swept her feet out from under her. She pulled herself out of the mud and found him grinning. Hugh Gibbet had leered at her sometimes and mocked her often, but Devi's grin was innocent. It suggested that if she could see herself, she'd laugh too. You shit on everything, Devi. Every time he trained me, it was all mockery and bruises and humiliation. For fuck's sake, this is actually fun. And I'm learning so much more from you. You're better than he ever was. No wonder you kick ass. Asses I have kicked, though finding them less sensitive than other places. <laughs> you did marry in Wadrin away. Devi tugged his own ear to indicate her earring. But are not Wadrin. Who is husband? Uh, Kylar Stern, sort of. Devi's eyebrows raised. It's, uh, complicated. 
He shrugged and drew a sword. He touched the edge to make sure it was shielded, and they began sparring again. V sank into it, releasing her worries about the life she was fleeing from and the life she was fleeing to. Even as she lost, time and again feeling the dull poke of Devi's sword, for the first time she had the sense that fighting was something she was really good at. When she countered a move that had caught her before, Devi might barely nod, but it was as good as a piece of praise. Devi shifted fighting styles no less than six times, and V sensed that he knew quite a few more, but the last one felt familiar. Her riposte brushed his stomach. V's eyes told her it was impossible. Her knowledge of illusory masks told her it was impossible. But she knew, and his reaction confirmed it. What are you doing here? No, it was the accent, wasn't it? Always takes me a while to get it back. You got some Yumori uncle or something? You fight like Kylar. What are you doing here? You bonded Kylo with the most powerful surviving set of compulsive wedding rings in the world. Was that your own idea? The God King put a compulsion on me. Sister Ariel said ringing was the way to break it. I thought Kylo was in love with that Eileen girl. Why'd he marry you? I uh, sort of ringed him when he was unconscious. Devi's expression went blank, and V had a sudden intuition that Durzo's blank look was as indicative of pending violence as Hugh Gibbet's rages. I'm here to decide if I should kill you to free Kyla from the bond. You're not making much of a case for yourself. V tossed her sword into the mud and shrugged. Fuck it. Kill me. Devi Durzo looked at her strangely, weighing her. Have you ever felt that you were part of a grand design, V? That some benevolence was shaping your fate? No. <laughs> me neither. Goodbye, V. Watch out for that husband of yours. He'll change you. Solinariwan Tofusen stood on deck as the Modaini merchant ship lumbered toward Hokai Harbor. It had been twelve years since he'd been to the Sethi capital, the city he had once called home. The sight of the two great chain towers guarding the entrance to the harbor, shining white in the autumn sun, filled his heart to bursting. As they passed between the towers, as always, his appreciation of the seemingly delicate towers became awe. Built during the height of the Sethi Empire, the chain towers stood on narrow peninsulas. The base of each tower abutted the ocean, so the chain couldn't be attacked without taking the tower. The chains themselves lay underwater, except during maintenance and war. Then the great teams of royal aurochs would winch the chains apart until they were at or barely below the waterline at high tide, and five to eight feet above it at low tide. During a battle, the aurochs would turn the chains. A single blade shaped like a shark tooth was attached to each link. Because of the half-twist in the chain at each axle, a ship pressing against the mighty chains would find half the teeth chewing through its hull in each direction. It made the entire chain a saw that had destroyed more than one fleet and deterred many more. Above the sparkling blue waters, the bay was a color to shame sapphires. Hokai rose on its three hills. Above the ubiquitous docks already filling with wintering ships, the great city rose in thousands of whitewashed walls with red tile roofs. After the ugly hodgepodge of scenarian architecture, it was a relief. But the most beautiful sight of all, a magnificent white cliff castle reigning over the highest hill, filled Solon not only with awe, but with something akin to terror. Katie, my love, do you hate me still? After Kali and her soul sworn massacred everyone at screaming winds, Solon had had nothing to do. His friend Fear had left days before they knew of the danger. When the garrison commander ignored Dorian's warnings that Kali was coming, Dorian disappeared. Solon had been the only man to escape. He'd found himself suddenly without ties to anything. It had been Dorian's prophecy that had kept him from going home more than a decade ago. Solon had served Regnus Geyer as prophecy dictated and failed. Regnus was dead. 
Solon had served for a decade only to be dismissed the day before Regnus was murdered. Katie was the Sethi Empress now. She wasn't likely to be happy to see Solon, but if she killed him, so much the better. He labored with the sailors. He could have paid for his passage, but no Sethi worth his salt would sit in a cabin while others were hoisting sails, not even on a wide-bellied Mordaini merchant ship. The Sethi preferred small light ships. It meant their merchants had to make twice as many trips, but they made them twice as fast. The Sethi ship also had to ride a storm rather than plow through it, but the Sethi accepted the ocean's winds and loved her and feared her equally. As the ship came to rest in the bay, the Modaini merchant captain emerged from his cabin, his eyes and eyebrows freshly cold. Solon always thought it gave the dark-haired Modaini a sinister aspect, but the captain was an affable man. He tossed Solon his pay and welcomed him to sail with him any time before going to speak with the harbor master, who had rowed out to collect the harborage tax and inspect the cargo. The harbor master clambered up the webbing onto deck with the ease of a man who did it a dozen times a day. Like most Sethi, he wore no tunic until winter, and the sun had darkened his skin to a deep olive. He had a prominent nose, brown eyes, the figure-eight earring of Clan Habashi, two silver rings on his right cheekbone, and two silver chains strung between the earring and cheek rings, an assistant to the harbor master then. The man stared open-mouthed at Solon. Solon, still bare-chested as he had been for the whole trip, wasn't as tanned as most Sethi. But despite his light tan and the white hair growing in to replace the black, he was unmistakably Sethi. And he wore no clan ring. The harbor master's long knife came out in a heartbeat. There were only two groups in Seth that wore no rings. What was your name, clanless? Solon. The harbor master grabbed Solon's chin and looked closely at his cheeks and ears, first on one side and then frustrated on the other. His eyebrows tightened in confusion. Not only were there no scars where the clan rings had been torn out, but there were no scars from where the rings had been put in. Raish Kodir Sethi. Sethi Kodai. Solon's old Sethi diction was perfect. What was your name? Solonary one Tofusen. The harbor master's tanned face turned green. He noticed that his long knife was still out and tucked it away as if it were scalding. I think you'd better come with me, uh, your lordship. What's going on? Solon overheard one of the sailors' explanations. Dothusen's reigned for 500 years. Not exactly. It was 477. Reigned? They don't anymore. No, Captain. The last one died 10 years ago. If this one really is a Dothusen, there'll be all sorts of hell to pay. That, on the other hand, is dead on. Callie's blood. Eric strode confidently across Luxbridge toward Dorian. That was rather impressive. Who are you? His eyes took in Janine but dismissed her. It's all right. Dorian tried to reassure Janine that it was, in fact, all right, though it wasn't. He destroyed a few teenage boys who had underestimated him. Peric Ursul was a man in the prime of his powers, and he was fresh, and he had six battle-hardened Verdmeisters backing him. One of the Verdmeisters whispered in Peric's ear. Peric straightened. No, surely not. Dorian? He stepped forward, and Dorian stepped forward as well, not willing to let Peric reach the end of Luxbridge unchallenged. Eric smirked. Seeing that smirk, Dorian hated him, despised him, wanted to crush him. I am Dorian. Six Verdmeister and Peric. Damn it, he only wanted to leave. The dark clouds overhead rushed past, coldly impartial. We thought you long dead, brother. A mistake we shall soon remedy. <laughs> Dorian lashed out with Veer and Talent Bolt, splitting the weaves to sweep the Birdmeisters off the bridge, and at the same time yanking at the magical underpinnings to drop the bridge into the abyss. They rebuffed the attacks with ease. Brother, brother. <laughs> this bridge will not drop a true-born Ursul. <laughs> the skulls embedded in Luxbridge seemed to laugh with him, their eyes glowing with magical fire. Indeed! 
If any of Gareth's sons were in danger, it would be you, Dorian, the mage trained. That's what I'm counting on. Dorian stepped forward out of the shoe he had cut free with his talent and put one bare foot on the bridge. There was a flash as the last quarter of the bridge sensed the mages and unraveled. Before them, Luxbridge reformed itself. We must go quickly. Stay close. Janine nodded, biting her lip. By the God, she was beautiful. She was worth it. Dorian stepped onto Luxbridge and it held. It was even more eerie, he thought, to walk across the span without the skulls. Looking at the harmless skulls of the dead scared him less than looking at clouds far beneath his feet. In moments, they made the crossing. The guards standing at the gatekeep gaped and dropped to their knees. Dorian recognized Rugger. I'm sorry. Rugger looked up, sure he was about to die. Dorian healed the man's forehead with a touch. Oh. Oh. Without the ugly protuberance, Rugger wasn't half bad looking. Rugger's hands went to his forehead, disbelieving. Hand in hand, Dorian and Janine stepped through the iron portcullis and looked over the city from their perch. Peric's army wound through the city and out onto the plain. The front of it was just beginning to climb up the ridge where Dorian and Janine stood. The men and women on the leading edge weren't soldiers. They were meisters and birdmeisters, 200 strong. And they were already halfway to Dorian. They couldn't help but have been aware of the magical firestorm he had just been a part of. Every one of them had their eyes fixed on him. Are we going to die? No. These people have lived under tyranny so long, they have no idea what to do after you've killed their leader. One more bluff, and we're on our way home. You really think you can bluff that? Dorian smiled, and he realized how long it had been since he'd thought about the future. He was no prophet now, but yes, he was sure. He was about to gamble it all for one last time. A few orders, a few curses, maybe a few deaths, and he and Janine would be on their way to Scenaria. It would work. It could, anyway. Something cold touched his cheek. Dorian blinked. What? What's wrong? Janine followed his eyes up. It's snowing. The passes will be closed. We're trapped. Snow made the worst weather for invisibility. In Scenaria, snow usually melted as soon as it hit the ground. But tonight it was sticking long enough to show footprints. The sleet itself gave shape to Kylo's body as it ran down his limbs. Kylo had to move as slowly toward the Curran camp as if he were an assassin. At least he still remembered how to sneak. And at least the clouds blocked the moon. Still, it was cold. As usual, Kylo was only wearing underclothes beneath the Kakari, and it wasn't enough. Kylo climbed a rocky knoll to get a better view. The Currens had four men camped on the windy hill, huddled around a banked fire with oil-soaked torches nearby so they could give signals to the army below. Kyler sat five paces from a weary sentry. The man was a peasant foot soldier rather than a soccer eye. His armor was made of plate sewn onto fabric. Rather than being fastened with leather, which was durable but would harden and shrink if it got wet too often, Currens always fastened their armor with ruinously expensive Lodricari silk laces. After the Battle of Pavel's Grove, Garawashi's plan had been to pull the Cenarian army east after his Kaladoran raiders, while the main strength of his own army swept behind them and took the capital. It would have worked, but for something he never could have foreseen. Walls. Most of Cenaria's old walls had been cannibalized for their stones. By the time Kyla was a child, generations of rabbits too poor to pay for masonry had finally left the Warrens without walls. The richer east side had seen a similar, if slower, erosion. But in the last few months, while Kyla was gone, walls had appeared around the entire city. It was breathtaking. With Cenaria's endemic corruption, it would have taken five generations of kings and millions of crowns to equal what Gareth Ursul's cruelty and magic had done in two months. Of course, 
He'd also had a ready supply of stone from all the houses Tara Grayson's followers had abandoned. And when those ran out, they simply demolished more homes and took what they needed. Now, the Curran army was laid out in a crescent hugging the south and east of the city. On finding walls, Garawashi's generals had prepared a siege until their leader could join them, which he had by now. The west side of the city was an alternately boggy and rocky peninsula that held the Warrens. West of that was the ocean. North of the city were mountains and only one crossing of the Plith River. Garawashi had contented himself with burning that bridge so he could concentrate his forces on the east side of the Plith and the two gates he would probably assault. Garawashi's army camped like the raiders Kyler had seen at the edge of Ezra's wood. Tents made up a grid pattern, with small streets separating the tents and wider streets between platoons, commanders' tents at regular intervals, couriers' tents next to those, and latrines and fires laid out with precision. What they didn't have were wagons. Whatever tunnels the currents had taken were evidently not big enough or too steep or too claustrophobic for horses. Garawashi had sacrificed everything for speed. The war leader himself had probably only caught up to his army in time to see the horror of the walls for himself. And now it was snowing. This was not going to be a protracted siege. When Tara Grayson had left Scenaria, those who had followed her had put their possessions to the torch to keep them from falling into Caledoran hands. How many granaries had gone up in those fires? Perhaps a better question was how many bakeries and mills and warehouses were left. For their part, Lantano Garawashi's men had the freedom of movement, but all the crops had been taken into the city long ago. Lantano's men could raid villages a few days out, but without horses they couldn't bring the food back quickly, and they could only bring what they could carry. Even if they stole horses and built a few wagons, that would take time, and they had an entire army to feed. Each side was going to be absolutely desperate within days. Logan's force outside the walls wasn't likely to do much to sway the balance, not without communication with Tara Grayson. If they could tell the Queen to hold on and not do anything stupid, Logan could use his cavalry to destroy any attempts Garawashi made at foraging. In a standoff involving 13,000 foot soldiers, a few hundred horses could make all the difference, if Tara didn't do anything stupid. Which meant someone needed to talk to her. Someone, oh let me guess. Kyler had six hours until dawn. It was going to be a busy night. Before he left, just for fun, he tied the silk laces of the sentry's leggings together. I'm sorry, Janine. I'm sorry we didn't leave earlier. With snow falling now, they would have had to leave a week ago to make it through the passes. A week ago, he hadn't even found Janine yet. There was nothing he could have done differently. You did everything you could. You were magnificent. Dorian opened his mouth to apologize, but she put a finger on his lips. Thank you. Janine reached up and kissed him gently. Mm. It shouldn't have meant so much, those words, that kiss, coming from a girl who thought she was about to die. But they were liquid fire and hope and life to Dorian. We do have one chance. We do? He shook himself and half man at least the Fiori ears and eyebrows and the less comfortable portions of his eunuch disguise, burst apart and disintegrated. Dorian! Dorian glared at him. Rugger dropped to his face. Oh, your holiness. It was that simple. Gareth Ursul had ruled absolutely. And if one disregarded the moral dimensions, he'd ruled efficiently as well. His death left a vacuum, and a people that expected to be ruled as they had been. They were a people accustomed to obeying orders instantly. Dorian and Janine ran across Luxbridge and into the castle. Before going to the throne room, Dorian ran to his old barracks. Hopper refused to open the door. Hopper instantly recognized him and dropped to his face. Hopper, damn it, I don't have the time. Go to the God King's chambers and get me the finest clothes you can as fast as you can. I need you girls to dress Janine appropriately. And then I need two or three of you to be throne ornaments. But it's dangerous. Only volunteers. And only if you can be ready in five minutes. I don't want to leave you. If this is going to work, 
You must. Janine nodded. He ran from the room. He didn't go to the throne room. He went to his brother's dormitories. They were littered with bodies. The Aethlings had grasped what the God King's death meant immediately. Several times in his search, Dorian saw younger children hiding beneath beds or in closets. He left them unharmed. All he was looking for were amplifae, and in several of the rooms he found many. The older Aethlings had collected or created as many amplifae as they could, knowing that one day they might be the difference between life and death. Dorian scooped as many as he could carry and ran to the throne room. The throne room itself had been the site of one of the worst battles. Twenty dead Aethlings and two Verdmeisters sprawled in the shit and stench of death. Two young men were still alive, though too badly hurt to use the beer. Dorian stilled their hearts and took his throne amid the stench of burnt flesh and hair and the coppery smell of blood. All the amplifae he had gathered were useless to him. He had some power left, but it would kill him to use what he would need to overmatch the number of Verdmeisters marching toward the throne room right now. Janine and Hopper and two young concubines jogged into the hall, Hopper as awkward as his namesake. <sighs> you look stunning. Janine was wearing green silks and emeralds. Dorian looked to the concubines. Ladies, your bravery will not be forgotten. They are across the bridge. Hopper produced some of Gareth's magnificent clothing, and women stripped Dorian and dressed him as quickly as they could. Dorian thought of the Meisters hurrying here even now. Would they go slowly enough to try to read the residue of the battles they passed? What would they make of the gap in Lux Bridge? He draped the heavy gold chains of office around his neck. You, there. And you, over there. Janine, on the floor beside the throne. He's sorry there's no chair. Hopper, over by the door in case I need you. He sat then in the great onyx throne, and as he put his hands on the sinuous arms of the chair, he felt connected to the whole citadel but most especially to its heart, its empty heart now, where Kali should have been. Dorian thanked the god that she wasn't there. He didn't know if he could survive that. He could feel the Meisters approaching the great doors, so through the throne that made the citadel like part of his body, he threw the doors open. The Meisters and Verdmeisters hesitated. There were hundreds of them and they took in the carnage of the dead Aethlings and the easy majesty of the man on the throne at once. Most of them had obviously expected to see Peric. Their jaws dropped. Others had known, had been able to read the Veer to know he died, and, as usual, hadn't shared their knowledge with their fellows, hoping it would give them an edge. Enter! He let those who were able to read the battle read it, then he waited. He let them look around the room, stare at the women, stare at the magic, even glance at Hopper. Dorian, the heir, returned from the dead. Dorian, the rebel. Dorian, the defiant. Dorian, the erased. He waited, and it made him remember when his father had been grooming him to rule. They had walked one day together in a wheat field. How do you keep such ambitious people in your grip? Gareth or Sul had said nothing. He simply pointed to a stalk of wheat that grew above its fellows and lopped its head off. These men were the ones who had survived generations of that process. None of them spoke for ten seconds, twenty, a minute. Dorian waited until he was sure one young Verdmeister was about to speak. Then, with his veer, he flung a staff at the man. The Amplifay hit the young witch's shield and fell to the ground. Dorian favored them with a condescending look, and slowly the Meisters lowered their shields. The young man, who'd been about to speak, scooted forward and picked up the staff, looking abashed. Then, Dorian threw another amplifier to the Meister on his right. She caught it. Then he threw another and another until he dispensed all of the dozens he had, even his own. There weren't enough for every Meister, of course, but there were enough to make Dorian's point. The king didn't arm his enemies. Dorian raised his beer to the surface of his skin and brought them not only into his arms, but up around his face. He allowed them to break through his scalp and form a living crown. There was pain there, 
pain as they broke his skin, and as they broke through channels of power that he had blocked long ago. He was powerful again now. Powerful and dread. Some of you recognize me as Dorian, first seed, first eightling, first survivor of training, first to accomplish his Urtan, first son of Gareth Ursul. But Dorian is dead! Yes, dead. You have read the Chronicles. Dorian is dead these twelve years, as now Peric is dead, and Rafe is dead. Dead! So now each of you has a choice. Will you question my resolve and try to take this throne? Or will you gather my enemies and bring them to me? The moment stretched unbearably. And then one young man hit his knees before his god king. Then another. Then it was a rush not to be the last. The new god king affected not to be surprised. Your holiness! If Dorian is dead, your holiness, what may we call you? God King Dorian was impossible, of course. Not only because his father had wanted him dead, Dorian didn't want Solon or Fear or any mages to ever hear of this. Better they think him dead. I am God King One Hope. One Hope was an archaic word that meant despair. When he looked at Janine, she looked frightened, but resolute. He squeezed her hand. As V descended from the pass in the afternoon, the snows became sleet and finally rain. Forests yielded to farms. Though she met no one on the road, anyone with sense was inside. V rounded a corner and found herself staring at Sister Ario sitting on a mare with all the grace of a sack of potatoes. In contrast to how miserably drenched V was, the bitch witch wasn't even wet. An inch above her skin and clothing, the rain sheared away, ran in rivulets over an invisible shell, and dropped to the ground. She smiled beatifically. Hello, V. It's good to see you're alive. I received a very odd message this morning telling me to expect you. From Devi? Who? Devira something Brumaji something. Devi Rahaman ko Brumezi Wakazari? Uh, that was it. You are a very impressive young woman, V. But the ghost of the steppes, if not only a legend, is 200 years dead. Someone was having fun with you. The what? Why are you here, V? No lies, please. Instantly. V felt herself caught between rage and tears again, out of control. She'd never been like this before. Since murdering Jarl, she'd been a disaster. Ringing Kyler had only made it worse. Even the things that should have been good, like learning Hugh was dead and helping kill the man who claimed to be her father, God King Gareth Ursul, had instead only thrown her further off balance. I'm here to become you, you bitch. To manipulate rather than be manipulated. To become the best. V tugged at her earring. And to get this fucking thing off. For your sake, I strongly suggest you come up with other reasons when the gatekeeper interviews you. So how about you shut your mouth and I'll pretend you're a normal young woman looking to join our sisterhood. It took a long time for V's rage to subside enough for her to nod. They rode together through the rain and soon the city emerged from the low-lying cloud. It's called Lake Town. For the obvious reasons. The city and the Chantry rested at the confluence of two rivers, which made a reservoir above Vestachi Lake. All the buildings of the city and the Chantry rested on islands in the reservoir, the nearest of which was 50 paces from the shore. Arching bridges connected every island to its neighbors and several to the shore, but streets themselves were absent. Instead, low, flat punts navigated the waterways. Some of them were covered against the rain, others exposed. Regardless, the punts moved far faster than they should have. V and Ariel entered the part of Lake Town that had grown on the shores by the bridges. But all the merchants seemed to be huddled in their dab and wattle homes with their chimneys or chimney holes smoking. By some ancient magic we still can't duplicate, the islands are actually floating. The entire dam can be opened and the islands flushed out into the lake in times of war. Of course, 
We haven't had to do that for centuries. And a good thing, too. I understand towing all the islands back up here is a lot of work. It's beautiful. The water is so clean. This city was built at a time when magic was used to benefit farmers and fishermen. There were special streams in every city that would take the stains out of your clothing. There were plows that could be pulled by a single ox that would break six furrows in a single pass. There were free public baths with water as hot or as cold as you wanted. Charms that kept meat from spoiling. People thought of magic as a tool, not only as a weapon. In Lake Town, the slops and night soil are supposed to be thrown into these pipes that... See? No smell? That take them directly to the dam. Of course, you can never get everyone to obey even a sensible law. Like not throwing night soil into the water you drink. So the lake itself has spells that cleanse it. Sister Ariel led them to a white punt on the far end of the dock. <clears throat> a boy dodged out into the rain to take their horses, and Bee took her bags and stepped onto the pump. He took some comfort in Sister Ariel's obvious terror that the boat was going to capsize. As soon as they were settled on the low, wet seats, the punt began moving by itself. V grabbed the side of the boat in a white knuckle grip. This magic, on the other hand, we can do. It's just too much trouble these days. They skimmed quickly into the wide water streets, and the little boat turned on its own. There are currents that shift on the turning of the glass. If you know what you're doing, you can get from one side of the city to the other, going downstream all the way. After a few minutes, they emerged into an enormous opening with no islands except the biggest one of them all. Behold the White Lady, the Alabaster Seraph, the Chantry, the Seraph of Nerev. And for you now, the home. The Chantry had looked big before, but only now, as they approached it, did it become apparent how massive it was. The entire building was carved in the likeness of a winged, angelic woman. She was too solid to actually be alabaster, too perfectly white to be marble. The stone shone even in the dim light of this dreary day. We imagined it would be blinding in the sunlight. As they came closer, V saw that what looked from a distance like erosion or pitting from age in the statue building's surface were actually windows and decks for the myriad of rooms inside, each nearly invisible because the surrounding stone was the same dazzling white. The seraph's wings were half unfurled, and she bore a sword in her left hand, point down, and a cool look on her face. As the punt circled around the back of the island, V saw that the seraph's right hand held a set of scales behind her back, with a feather on one side and a heart on the other. Hundreds of docks crowded the back side of the island, and despite the rain, dozens of boats were loading and unloading all manner of supplies and people. The white punt skimmed straight to the nearest set of docks, passing beneath an arch of living wisteria, impossibly still in bloom with a riot of purple flowers. The punt came to rest, and two sisters in black robes greeted them. We go with them. No threat they make is idle. It has been years since anyone died during initiation, but it is possible. May whatever god you believe go with you. And if you believe in none, Good luck. The worst part wasn't that the last god V wanted with her now was Nysos, to whom she had offered her body and soul and the blood of so many innocents. The worst part was that Sister Ariel's good wishes sounded absolutely sincere. The first step was breaking into the city. Kyla knew there had to be dozens of smugglers' routes, but that wasn't the kind of information smugglers handed out at Sakage parties. He did know what he was looking for, though. It would be hidden within a few hundred paces of the walls, and it would emerge somewhere onto rock so as not to take hoof prints and wagon tracks, and it would be somewhere close to one of the main roads. On the low hills surrounding the city, a month ago buildings had lined every road. Taverns farmhouses, hostleries, and any of the innumerable trade houses that catered to travelers who hadn't the coin for accommodations or services in the city. Now, there were no buildings. 
the Currens had taken everything. They had dismantled every building and brought the materials into their camp. Kyla could only imagine the frenzy the Sakage must have been in, trying to decide which tunnels to collapse and which to salvage, hoping to preserve their own way out of the city if all else failed. He moved through the current camp slowly, dodging from shadow to shadow. He had eschewed invisibility for a hazy black, hoping it would be harder to see than the odd distortions of sleet hitting something that wasn't there. His eyes should have given him a distinct advantage in searching for a smuggler's entrance. He finally found a large, low rock sitting feet from the main road with trees on either side of it. It was perfect. If the rock swung open, smugglers could pull their wagon onto the main road unseen and leave no tracks. Kyler brushed the sleet away from the rock and saw telltale scrapes from the iron-bound wagon wheels grinding against the rock. This was it. Ten minutes later, he still hadn't made any progress. Every two minutes he had to hide as a sentry made his rounds, and every five minutes a different sentry overlapped from the opposite side. Kyla couldn't blame the interruptions, though. He just couldn't find the catch that opened the door. Maybe it was the sleet, making his fingers clumsy with the cold. Or maybe he just wasn't as good as he thought. Immortal, not invincible. Why Durzo have to be right all the time? Come to think of it, where the hell is Durzo? The thought affected Kyler more profoundly than he expected. He'd lived for months thinking his master was dead. In all those months, Durzo hadn't bothered to come see Kyler. Kyler had thought himself his master's best friend. Even when Aristarchos Ban Abram had told him of all the heroes his master had been, Kyler had still thought that his relationship with Durzo was special. In a way, learning all the great men his master had been made Kyler feel better about himself. But time had moved on, and apparently so too had Durzo. Whatever brief importance Kyler had had in that man's seven-century-long life, it was finished. Kyler sat down on the rock. The sleet soaked through to his underclothes in seconds. It made him feel even worse. Don't tell me you're gonna cry. You mind? Wake me when the South Pea's done, would you? Damn you, you sound just like Durzo. So I stay with the man night and day for seven centuries and he rubs off on me. You only spend ten years with him. Look how much like him you are. I'm not like him. No, you're just out here trying to save the world by yourself. Again, by coincidence. He did this kind of thing a lot? Ever hear of the Malaysian aggression? The death of six kings? The Vandazian uprising? The escape of the Grosk twins? Um, actually? No. <sighs> I'm an idiot. An epiphany. Long overdue, too. But then I've come to expect small things. Kala walked to the wall. The great stones had been hardened with spells and fitted more tightly to their neighbors than weight and mortar could accomplish. Kala brought the Vicari to his hands and feet. Oh, I should make you swim. Kala smirked and felt the stone dimple under his fingers and toes. He began climbing. Any hopes he had that Tara Grayson wasn't going to do something stupid died as he reached the top of the wall. With four hours until dawn, men were already preparing to attack the Sakura. Most of the soldiers were still asleep and the horses still in their stables, but a huge area had been cleared inside the south gate. Flags had been planted so that the regiments could find their positions first thing in the morning, and squires were scurrying around making sure armor and weapons were in top condition. From the size of the area cleared, Kyla guessed that the Queen was preparing an all-out attack at dawn, committing perhaps 15,000 men for the attack. He squinted at the flags doing the math. He wouldn't have said she had so many men. The answer was in the flags nearest the gate. More than one flag bore a rabbit. The Queen had conscripted rabbits and put totally untrained peasants at the spearhead of the attack on the most highly trained Sakurai in the world? It was one thing to throw your peasants against the other side's peasants when you had space to try to bring in cavalry from the side or something. But when the Cenarians came pouring out the gate, Garawashi's Sakurai would meet them immediately. The battle would be confined to one front. The peasants would find themselves all alone, getting slaughtered, unable to move forward because of the Sakurai, unable to move back because the rest of the army was trying to get out of the south gate. 
It would probably only be minutes before they panicked, and then it was only a matter of how many people would be slaughtered before Luke Grayson called off the attack and tried to shut the gates before the Sakurai got into the city. <coughs> Kala dropped into the great yard and stole a leather gamison from a pile, along with trousers and a tunic. A minute later, he stepped out from behind the smithy as a boy hurried past, pushing a cart filled with cheap swords and pole arms. So the rabbits get to lead the attack. Hit him at dawn. Kyla waved at the battle flags. How'd that happen? We volunteered. I know a man who volunteered to snort gooey pepper sauce. It didn't make it a good idea. What are you saying? Why is the queen letting them go first? It's not the queen. It's her brother Luke. He's the Lord General now. And? We said the, uh, the casualties would be the highest among the first ones out. Uh, you know, uh, till we took out the archers. Oh, the rabbits ain't scared of nothing. So the new Lord General manages to cull his bravest citizens and ensure a crushing defeat all at once. Brilliant. You mind? I got work to do. Kyler stole a horse. He didn't have the time to walk to the castle. Kyler rode as fast as he could. He left the horse and the stolen clothes before he got to East Kingsbridge and went invisible. He ran the rest of the way. Rather than run through the twisting, illogical halls of the castle, he climbed the wall. In minutes, he dropped onto the Queen's balcony, which was still missing part of the railing where Kyler had freed Mags Drake's corpse. He looked inside. The Queen wasn't alone. Before I sent you after Sister Jessie, you said you'd been studying something for two years. Ariel was sitting with Sister Astariel Wyant, the Speaker of the Chantry, in her office, high in the Seraph. What was it? The Kakarifer. <sighs> the what? My Hyrillic isn't what it used to be. A doubtful look crossed Ariel's face. Your Hyrillic was never what it used to be. If I recall correctly, your marks in all your language classes... The uh... question, Ariel. Only perhaps a dozen sisters in the Chantry would recall how poorly she had performed in a few of her classes, and none of them would dare correct the speaker. None except Ariel, who was not correcting her because she thought being Estariel's sister gave her license. Ariel would correct anyone. The bearers of the Stones of Stones... Colloquially, that would have meant stones of greatest power. The original bearers were Jorsen's champions of light, Tres Arvagula Nia. Fascinating. I think you would have liked her. She was one of the foremost minds of the age, in an age famous for great minds. Probably not matched even to the present day. Though I know Rizerti argues that Melovian period is as important... I personally find his contentions regarding the Aletaran succession to be weak. I think there were complete breaks with Malaysian traditions during the Interregnum. But I'm getting sidetracked. Trace, this brilliant but horribly ugly woman. In some accounts, the ugliest woman of the age. Though I think those legends are as greatly exaggerated as most of the others. Was given a stone that conferred all beauty upon her. The poets couldn't even agree what she looked like. I believe, in keeping with Rumbauer's paper sententia, damn all Lord de Carre scholars and the clotted syntax, but there you have it, that the confusion was because the Kakari's power was not that it shifted Trace's appearance, but that it directly affected viewers' perceptions of her, in each case making her what would be most attractive to them. Imagine the fortune Ezra could have made in cosmetics. <laughs> you know, okay. Fascinating. Of course, that Kakari disappeared and has never resurfaced. I imagine it would have if it were anything but a legend. There is much stronger evidence in support of the red Kakari's existence. Originally, it was given to Corveo Blackwell. Ironically enough, Lord Blackwell would henceforth be known as Corveo the Red. And after he died during the Battle of Jaren Flats, it was taken by a man named Malak Mukmazi. Malak Firehands in our tongue, though obviously that translation doesn't preserve the alliteration. Accounts from both sides claimed that he fought from within the conflagration that swept the plain and broke the Durvali army. Again, after his death, 
Apparently, fire isn't much good against poison. <laughs> um, uh, hmm. Well, it seems to have reappeared in various hands throughout history. Some of those had credible witnesses. Her dios, whom we trust for all sorts of other stories that have checked out, claims to have personally... Did you learn anything new? I concluded that the review of all the currently available literature on the subject still left the most pertinent questions open. And most of the less pertinent ones as well. So it took you two years to figure out that you weren't going to figure anything out. That's why I was willing to go see about Jesse Alguedin. And not because your speaker asked you to? For a moment, Astariel was jealous of her oblivious older sister. Ariel was a rock, and the waves of politics passed her with sound and fury and she didn't even notice. She was a bore, but a useful one. Whenever Astariel had needed an expert opinion on the magical sides of dilemmas, Ariel could be loosed on the problem like a hound to scent, and she wouldn't share her findings with anyone except the book she wrote and Astariel. All in all, Ariel was worth far more than the trouble she caused. But did she have to be so boring? If Ariel had turned her brilliant mind to politics, well, Astariel had thought of that before in her more paranoid moments. If Ariel had the inclination for such things, Ariel would be the speaker and Astariel would probably be some farmer's brood mare. The key to handling Ariel was understanding that she was a believer. Not a believer in some god, but a believer in the chantry. There was something endearingly naive in women who believed all that seraph's handmaiden tripe. It made them far easier to handle than the magi who believed only in themselves. Point in a direction, say, good for the Chantry, and Ariel would do anything. Ariel, I've got a problem I need your help with. I know you've never accepted a Tiro. I'll do it. But I want you to think about the good of the... What? You want me to teach Vridiana Sovari, so she's protected until she can destroy Eris Buell and the Chattel. I'll do it. Estariel's heart jumped into her throat, so nakedly laid out. It was a plot whose discovery would bring down a speaker. Never say that. Not ever. Not even here. Ariel cocked an eyebrow at her. Estariel smoothed her dress. She's being initiated this evening? As we speak. Apparently, there are some difficulties. It's been hours. How talented is this girl? Is she Eris Buell's equal? No. Not even close. Fuck! You misunderstand. 